Be ready. That was the motto of the Boy Scouts. The Scout Act was different. The law stated that a Boy Scout must be reliable, loyal, helpful, friendly, polite, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean and respectful, and also naive, apparently, stupid, idiot, trusting. Nick had no other answers after checking the email on his wife's iPhone. He usually didn't look at anything on her phone at all, and she knew that very well, so she didn't bother to use any additional protection. After all, he was a Boy Scout. He didn't invade anyone's privacy. But Nick's wife was leaving town in a few weeks, and Nick was trying to remember the name of her hotel. She told him about it before, but he didn't pay attention and wanted to avoid an argument about why he didn't pay attention. These debates have become a bit more frequent lately. The trip would be their longest time apart since their wedding five years ago, and Nick had been thinking about doing something romantic, like sending flowers. After all, what better way to show the woman he loves, how much he loves her, than to send her flowers when she was several thousand miles away, in the City of Love, Paris. It was the City of Love, okay, but he wasn't who she was going to love there. No, it had to be Dwayne, who was also going on a trip. After entering the password to his wife's phone, the date of their wedding, Nick found himself reading one of the non-work-related emails his wife and Duane had exchanged over the past few weeks. They talked about walking along the Champs-Élysées at night, then taking a boat ride on the Seine in the moonlight, and then making wonderful love all night. Almost as surprising as the affair itself was the fact that Nick's wife Linda and her lover Duane exchanged messages using their work email accounts. She should have known better. So does Duane. Like Nick, Linda was a lawyer. Duane was a paralegal at Linda's firm. All three have conducted extensive document analysis in major litigation cases where huge teams of lawyers and paralegals have read every one of the hundreds of thousands of emails generated or being considered for document discovery proceedings. The story was always that one or two idiots had an affair, and the lawyers then tried to figure out whether the affair had anything to do with the case and, if so, how to limit the damage. The truth is that the reason Nick didn't pay attention when Linda told him about the trip and the name of the hotel the team would be using was because something strange was going on. Nick didn't know what it was at the time, but his instinct made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Five years as a lawyer, listening to clients lie and listening to lawyers scrupulously avoid lying by not telling everything had sharpened his listening skills. And something was wrong when Linda first told him about the trip. A very boring arbitration process that would keep them so busy that they wouldn't even be able to enjoy the sights. She said this without looking at him at all. And too frivolous. She knew that Paris was one of Nick's favorite cities and they always talked about going there together because Linda had never been there. So Nick found her answer strange. But he didn't even imagine such a worst-case scenario. The email line he was looking at now was a stiletto stabbed straight into his heart. Why don't you just get rid of the Boy Scout so we can spend more time together without worrying? Dwayne wrote this last night. I feel safe with him. Linda answered. So why are you having fun with me behind his back every chance you get? You do it better. Nick had no idea what he was going to do at this point. Other than forward all correspondence to his address and print out the email exchange on the printer just in case. No doubt, as an experienced lawyer, his first instinct was to preserve the evidence. After printing out the emails and putting them away, Nick began to think. He definitely knew what he wanted to do. He needed to think before he hurt anyone. This thinking is what made him a lawyer. He was paid to use his brains, not his brawn. And he had to think about it quickly because Linda was out for a run and would be back soon. But before he could think, he needed to finish the mission and find a hotel. However, this would not be for sending flowers. He didn't know why he would need this information, but he just knew he needed it. Perhaps as a target, close to the Eiffel Tower. About a five-minute walk from the International Chamber of Commerce, where Linda and Duane will be working on their arbitration case with the rest of the team, at least when the two lovers have some free time. Once he found the hotel... He had to quickly do a computer search on Virginia divorce law. He remembered some things from the bar exam five years ago, 
but it was always good to check. Adultery was grounds for divorce and could affect issues such as alimony and division of property. But the accusation of adultery also had its own nuances. One of them was connivance. Finding out about the adultery and then voluntarily resuming sexual relations and continuing to live together was her defense. So, he needed to get out of the house and quickly. And there should be no confrontation. Not yet. He fully intended to hit her with complete shock and awe without any unknowns thrown into the mix. He was going to dominate the battle space for the rest of this marriage, which meant he would have to lie. Inconsistent with the Boy Scout law, but it was war. After all, it was Churchill who said, Truth is so valuable in wartime that it must always be accompanied by a bodyguard of lies. Nick's lies would serve a higher purpose now. In any case, none of them were under oath. He went up to the master bedroom and began to pack his things. He finished quickly and placed his suitcases by the front door. He had almost finished gathering the important documents he needed, bank and credit card statements, 401k and IRA statements, car titles, pay stubs, mortgage, and Linda's latest student loan balance when she returned from her run. He heard her in the kitchen as he rose from his basement office. He decided to look exhausted and out of sorts, when he saw his wife. Her shoulder-length brown hair was pulled back into a ponytail. She looked good. It's a pity that she was disgusting in his eyes. He already knew that love was dead. You know, I'm going to Paris, he said with a grim smile. The color drained from Linda's face. Her blue eyes turned pale. What? Paris, Virginia. Her shocked expression quickly disappeared. Sven just called, Nick continued. We are testifying in an insurance case and we must prepare a witness. Apparently we just lost the motion to compel, the judge is pissed, and the entire investigation timeline is in chaos. I'm going to be on the road for a few weeks, although I'll probably have the opportunity to stop by from time to time to visit. Poor baby, Linda said with an appropriate expression of concern. Maybe your company is hiring... I would prefer to go to your Paris, Nick said and saw concern appear on her face again. But then she grinned. Send me your resume. Maybe you have the right amount of experience for us to consider you. It was a joke. Linda's law firm ranked higher in the rankings than Nick's. Then, perhaps with some guilt, she made a move as if she was going to hug him. But Nick turned and returned to his office before she could close the gap. The visions of him slapping her in the face were coming back, and he wasn't sure he could keep them under control. Back upstairs, Linda asked what he wanted for dinner. I can't stay for dinner. I'll grab something on the way. Sven is going crazy and wants me to hit the road immediately. He spoke, bustling around the kitchen. Linda followed him to the door, looking a little worried. As he grabbed his suitcases and heated for the door, she pursed her lips for a goodbye kiss. Sorry, I think I may have caught a cold. This morning I have a sore throat. Maybe it's an allergy, but I don't want you to catch anything. Linda followed him to the car as he loaded it. When will you be back? Probably not before Friday. We're going to Roanoke after Paris. Then next week we have to go to Baltimore. Perhaps he was becoming even more paranoid, but he thought he could hear the gears of her brain turning as he watched her avert her eyes as if imagining how his absence would open up some unexpected possibilities for her. Waving goodbye, he backed out of the driveway. He hoped she would simply assume that he was busy with work and annoyed that he had been called on Saturday. His acting couldn't handle much more at the moment, but he suspected that she was already planning to invite Dwayne over. Nick drove until he came to a nearby shopping center with a coffee shop. Like most lawyers, he thought better by putting it down on paper. As he finished his coffee, he began to make a list of things that needed to be done. He paused for a moment to realize that he had never thought about reconciliation. That wasn't even an option. There will only be retribution. The only question was the degree of retribution. The ringing tone of his phone interrupted him. He didn't recognize the number. Yes? he answered impatiently. Mr. Buford, I'm Sam Granger. I don't think we've met, but I'll get straight to the point. I got your number from the internet. 
I'm in the business of buying old houses and tearing them down to build mansions. I know, I know. Everyone hates what I do, but they don't hate me as much when I give them a check. Granger spoke so fast that Nick didn't have time to react other than to think that the house wasn't old. It was cozy. And what the hell? He started talking about tearing it down, but then his rational mind took over. And, well, I'd like to buy your house so I can tear it down. I would suggest building a shopping center, but I can never guarantee a timeline for new construction, especially with county permits and all. I make all my profit by getting these deals done quickly, and I think I can give you a very good price if you and your wife are interested in selling. Nick had a hard time keeping a Grinch-like smile from spreading across his face. Linda chose their house just before they got married. It was an old ranch, but it had a beautiful yard that was right next to an area of woods with a creek running through it. It was close to major highways, but secluded enough to be peaceful. What absolutely convinced her was the treehouse in the yard across from the master bedroom window. She loved that it was a home ready for children. Nick simply loved the price and the fact that it was only 20 minutes from the main parking lot of the subway system. That and a 30-minute train ride to work made moving to the area quite convenient. Mr. Granger, I will be away for the next few days, so I cannot guarantee access to the property. Call me Sam. I don't need to see it inside. Like I said, it's a wreck, and I've already checked the outside of the house. Can you meet on Sunday morning, Sam? Certainly. By the way, I will probably close the deal myself with my wife's power of attorney. She is very busy with work-related matters these days. No problem. I'll give you the form we use. Nick noted the address and began to see the outline of the plan. She felt safe with her Boy Scout, didn't she? This is because Linda didn't know that good old Lord Baden-Powell was using military intelligence as a model for what would become his boys' movement. Skills such as stealth, cunning, and self-confidence. In other words, ambushes. She'll never see what happens next until it's too late. But first, reconnaissance. To do this, he put his empty coffee cup on the table and went out to the car to get some privacy. He picked up his phone and dialed a number. Frank, he asked when the call was answered, I need a favor. And I need it now. Frank Barry was a private detective. During his five years of corporate legal work, Nick made it a point to also do pro bono work to help poor people with their legal problems. This corresponded to his ideas about the life of a worthy person. And what's more, it gave him real-life experience in court, something his regular job didn't usually provide. One of his law school classmates recommended that Frank help with a nasty divorce case involving a stepfather who had sexually abused his stepdaughter. Frank's evidence got the guy released when the police's lackadaisical response failed, and that evidence led to a quick divorce. Frank listened as Nick explained what he had learned. And you think your wife is going to put him in your bed tonight? Is she really that arrogant? She became very arrogant. She was one of the top students in her law school class. He thinks he can't make a mistake. I do it myself. I owe you. This Rivera divorce case brought me all kinds of good publicity. The phone rings constantly. I appreciate it, Frank, Nick said. By the way, there's a treehouse in the backyard that you might want to use. Its windows look directly into the master bedroom, and she likes to do things with the curtains open. It used to drive me crazy. But whatever started her engine was accepted, you know? You can get there by crossing the forest and jumping over the stream after dark. No fences and no dogs around. There is a service road on the other side where you can park. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to hide a camera outside, pointing it at the front of the house, to keep track of who comes and goes and when. Great. And you're using Harry for a divorce, right? I'm guessing you want a divorce. Yes and yes. Fine. I know how much he likes the affidavit and the reporting process. If you're right, we'll find out pretty soon. Nick then called Harry. Is this about the law school reunion, Nick? I have already received five calls about contributing to their fund. No, I want to hire you. Linda cheats, and I want to burn this bitch. After Nick filled him in, Harry said, Come tomorrow. I know it's Sunday, but I still needed to sort out some paperwork at the office, so I was getting ready to head out. We might as well take action. 
It seems that you have already realized that adultery cannot be condoned. Frank already covers the adulterous part with clear and convincing evidence. The hardest part will be simply fighting for a financial settlement. She's also a lawyer at a big firm, so she'll have the resources to fight and stall, plus people in her firm giving her advice. Leave it to me, Nick said. I think we can work this out like civilized people. Then that means you're not going to burn the bitch, but okay. We can see what you come up with. His last call was more delicate. Hello? Maggie, this is Nick. The silence on the other end of the line was deafening. Maggie, you son of a bitch. It's nice to talk to you too, honey, after all these years. What do you want, Nick? After all this time, I need your help. I thought Linda was your assistant. It's about Linda. She went on a spree. What a surprise. I really can't believe it. Stupid. Did you realize that all this is framed in quotation marks? I can't help you emotionally or sexually these days. I am dating. And I'm sure he's a happy guy. Look, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry we fooled around and let it ruin our friendship. I'm also sorry that I let Linda kick you out of my life when I thought there was a chance that we could be friends again. But now I need your friendly help. What do you need, Nick? He told her. There was silence on the line. Then laughter. I agree, she said after she had calmed down, but he could still hear the smile in her voice. You always made me laugh. Thank you, Maggie. When the dust settles, you'll have to introduce me to Mr. Lucky so I can congratulate him on his excellent taste and invite you both to dinner. It's a date, she said. He needed somewhere to hide for a while and plan. So he found an extended stay hotel outside the Beltway in Fairfax far enough away from his and Linda's usual haunts where he wouldn't risk being seen, settled in, and then went to get something to eat. He wasn't actually hungry, but he knew he needed something in his stomach to fuel the alcohol he planned to drink. A restaurant called El Mariachi was across the street from the hotel. When the hostess seated him in a booth, he saw that the bartender was looking at him. He seemed vaguely familiar, but Nick put it out of his mind. At the moment, he had enough reason to worry. The menu items indicated that the restaurant was an establishment pretending to be Mexican. Most Americans didn't understand the difference. He ordered some inexpensive tequila with his meal. He knew the hangover the next day would be severe, but he considered the pain part of the cleansing ritual. The waitress returned with a bottle of excellent tequila from the top shelf. When Nick looked up at the waitress, she simply pointed to the bartender who saluted him. Nick returned the greeting and poured himself a generous drink as the bartender returned to serving other customers. It took a moment, but Nick remembered who he was. He remembered the bartender as one of the members of the public who attended Rivera's divorce hearing, as well as the criminal trial that Nick attended. He always sat in the last row alone. No one ever sat next to him. His client's daughter Sonia hugged him one day, but when Nick asked Sonia who it was, she became very quiet and said he was just a family friend. Nick ate in silence, making notes on a notepad and drinking tequila. After the waitress cleared away his dirty plates, he went to the toilet. He was aware that things seemed to move around, as if he were on a ship as he walked. He needed to lean against the wall while he did his business. He then returned to the booth, trying to act as confident as possible and found the bartender sitting in his booth on the opposite bench. Senor Nick, good to see you, he said, reaching out to take Nick's hand and shake it vigorously. Nick sat down and waited for what he would say. I never thanked you for helping my cousin deal with that bastard she was married to. Nick tried to argue that it was nonsense and he was just doing the little he could, but the bartender ignored him. He was severely beaten in prison. Did you know about this? very much. They don't think he'll be able to walk again or eat solid food. The bartender had a small smile on his face as he told Nick this. Nick felt a chill as he looked at the bartender. I didn't hear that, Nick said. The bartender shrugged. This is yesterday's news. What brought you to El Mariachi alone on a Saturday night? Where is your charming wife? Nick looked the bartender straight in the eyes. The bartender was still smiling. It was not a mocking smile more like a smile that knew a lot. Nick couldn't understand why he asked such a strange question. 
How did the bartender even know Nick was married? Nick then remembered that Linda surprised him by showing up at one of the hearings and kissed him after it was over. The bartender must have still been in the courtroom. We have some problems with her, Nick said. He saw no reason to lie or hide information. Like she's having fun with someone else? Again, with a knowing smile. Nick was shocked and fell silent. I'm not a lawyer, Don Nicholas, but I know that if you want to keep a secret, you shouldn't write it down and leave the paper in plain sight, said the bartender, pointing to Nick's notebook. It noted elements of adultery, had drawings showing Duane being stabbed to death, contained the name Linda surrounded by a circle with a slash, and had a to-do list that included the phrase burn the bitch. Nick shrugged. Poor operational security, but at least it didn't give away any sensitive customer data. Any man in your situation should ask himself what he wants. What do you really want, Senor Nick? What would you want more than anything in the world, other than money, if you could choose your revenge? Nick didn't hesitate. I want to hit her on the nose so hard that it breaks. And I want to hit her in the face so hard that both her eyes turn black. She has a very beautiful face and very expressive eyes. I want to destroy them. The bartender's smile grew wider. He then chuckled, shaking his head. You, my friend, are not thinking rationally. People who take revenge so cruelly end up in prison. You don't want to go to jail, not unless it happens while you're visiting your clients. Right? The bartender paused and looked slyly at Nick. Nick nodded. But maybe I can help with something. You helped my cousin with her little problem. She could have turned to me for help, but for various reasons, she refused to do so. You, however, stepped in and took care of her. Nick tried to interrupt him. Sure, he asked Frank to gather evidence, but he made the police do all the work. It didn't hurt when Nick asked one of the partners from his firm, a former assistant United States attorney from the area, to calmly speak with the prosecutor to make sure the criminal case was getting the proper treatment. Nick showed up with his client only to make sure she had the proper respect from the prosecutor. His client's divorce itself was commonplace after her husband was convicted in a criminal case. The bartender brushed off his protests. You must understand that helping ordinary people like my cousin is worthy of attention in itself. I am in your debt on behalf of my family. I always pay back my debts. I think you could use some help. Nick looked at him intently. I'm afraid I don't remember your name. The bartender's smile turned into a shark-like grin. Some people call me El Diablo. Devil? The bartender nodded. That's what people who don't like me call me. To my friends, I'm Jose Garcia. Now it was Nick's turn to smile. What should I do to receive a favor from the devil? Sell my soul? El Diablo's smile disappeared. Nick didn't smile either. Be serious. You are a lawyer. You have no soul. His smile returned, and Nick knew he was joking. Call it professional courtesy, Senor Nick. Now just give me your address, your wife's name, and tell me what her daily routine is. What are you going to do? I have several ideas. But what does this phrase sound like? Ignorance is bliss. I think you need to be blissfully unaware and be able to report on your movements over the next few months. Buy yourself a burner phone so we can keep in touch and leave the number here at the bar. And then don't come back here again. It will be better this way. Nick told El Diablo about hiring a private investigator, his plans to stay home until Linda left for France, and Linda's travel plans. El Diablo knew this hotel in Paris, but did not say from where. Just one question, Senor Nick. Is there any chance of reconciliation, forgiveness, mercy? I don't want to hear later. I changed my mind. El Diablo looked him straight in the eyes. The smile disappeared. His expression became serious. Nick returned his gaze. Nick took a deep breath and paused to check his emotions again. The path was clear. He was a simple guy. Trust and loyalty. These were his most important values. They left his marriage. Linda flipped a switch in his brain, and love was now replaced by hate. Over time, upon reflection, he simply won't care. That time was not now. 
No one. El Diablo relaxed. Fine. Don't worry about anything. The waitress brought the bill. El Diablo shooed her away, but allowed Nick to tip her generously. He also allowed Nick to take a bottle of tequila with him, but warned him to slow down. He needed a clear mind for battle. Somehow Nick woke up at a reasonable hour on Sunday morning without much of a hangover. He arrived at Harry's law office at 10 a.m. and found Frank already there. Sorry, Nick, Frank said. She definitely had sex with that guy. In your bed. He was there two hours after you called me, and he was still there when I left this morning. We received a very good quality video. I made you a copy, but you might not want to watch it. Harry interrupted him. You better not look. I don't want you to do something stupid and get arrested. Don't worry, Nick said, taking the DVD from Frank. Give me the rundown. I climbed into that treehouse just like you said, and they were all over each other. I got really clear shots of their faces and, frankly, the rest of their bodies. They were clearly having sex. Anyway, I think it's just a physical thing. They hardly spoke. I don't know if this will change your plans. No. How long? They both had great stamina. Thank you. This makes me feel even worse. Sorry. Anyway, I know Linda personally from the party you had last year, so I can identify her. We checked this guy's license plates. It's Dwayne Martin. We know he's working with her. We don't know how long this has been going on, but it seems to me that this is clear and convincing evidence. Oh, and we have a camera in a nearby tree filming the driveway and garage so we can see when they come and go. I will email you a remote link to the live stream on our secure server. I have spoken to Harry and am going to write a report and supporting affidavit for him to file. Sorry again, dude. Frank shook hands with Harry and Nick and left the office. So, what do you want to do? asked Harry. File for divorce on the grounds of adultery. But don't serve her. Harry looked at Nick without any expression. Trust me, Harry. When I hear these words, I get an upset stomach. I don't want you to do anything stupid here. I predict that everything will go more smoothly than you imagine. Harry winced. Look, Harry, just file this on Monday afternoon right before the court office closes. Let me know the case number. I'll take care of the rest. Just remember, Nick, I don't practice criminal law. Not very good anyway. If you need to get out of some trouble, I can't help you. You'll be pleasantly surprised, Nick said as he walked out the door. Nick's next stop was to meet Sam Granger. It was a very productive meeting where Nick learned that they could sell the house for over $100,000 more than the mortgage, all without real estate agent commissions. Linda would be delighted, if only she knew. Nick promised to return with the proper paperwork as soon as possible to seal the deal. As Nick left Sam's office, he looked at his phone. No messages or calls. She must still be having fun with Dwayne. Nick took the opportunity to call his boss Sven and tell him that he urgently needed two weeks of vacation or he would quit. Sven immediately panicked because Nick was the only one who knew what was going on with the current affairs and agreed. Luckily, in Sven's case, they had a temporary lull in business so he could cut Nick some slack. Having laid the groundwork for the fulfillment of his intentions, Nick returned to his hotel to take care of his current work. By Monday evening, it was ready. Linda left voicemails on Sunday evening and Monday evening, which he did not respond to. He was saving all his energy for Tuesday morning. Thanks to Frank's camera in front of the house, Nick knew that Duane had spent Monday night there, and based on Duane's stay from Sunday evening to Monday morning, he would likely leave around 8 hours a.m. to head to work. Linda was leaving around 8.30 a.m., so at 7 hours a.m., Nick walked through the front door and shouted, Darling! I'm home. He heard a sudden noise upstairs, and then Linda came down the stairs in her robe, disheveled and shocked. Honey, what a surprise, she said, trying to seem cheerful, but barely holding it in and just as clearly on the verge of complete panic. I thought you wouldn't be here until Friday. You didn't answer my calls. Sorry, Nick answered cheerfully. You know how it happens. Nick pretended not to notice the two glasses of wine left in the living room and headed straight to the dining room. 
Linda stood in the doorway, looking at Nick, trying to figure out her next move and how to stop him from going up the stairs to where Dwayne was obviously hiding. A knock on the door made her jump. Can you open it, honey? Nick asked. Meanwhile, he began laying out papers on the dining room table and pretended not to notice as Linda squared her shoulders and went to open the door, perhaps expecting the bailiff to arrive with the divorce papers. Instead, it was Maggie who walked right in as soon as Linda opened the door, simply saying, Hello! Linda watched with curiosity as Maggie sat down at the dining table and opened her suitcase. Sorry, honey, Nick said, but I don't know when I'll be on air again. And you know, I can't think of you going on a foreign trip without renewing your powers of attorney. You know, just in case something goes wrong and we need to deal with some financial or medical emergencies. Oh, and I had a couple of moments over the weekend and got a tip on refinancing my mortgage at a really great rate. Since we are both going to be traveling, I thought this was the only time we would be able to do it. Sorry for the urgency. He tried to look apologetic. Who is this? Linda asked, pointing at Maggie when the artery in her temple stopped pulsing violently. I'm Maggie. Maggie is a notary, Nick explained. Linda visibly relaxed. She still had a lover hidden upstairs, but events had not yet completely spiraled out of control. You, my boy scout, always ready? She said with a grin as she sat down, although her eyes were still wary. It's just who I am, honey. He handed Linda a pen and began laying out the papers in front of her. The flags with arrows show you where to sign. Take the time to read the documents if you want. I trust you, Linda said with a wide smile, quickly signing all the papers in front of her. He prayed to God that she would do it because otherwise he was screwed. But, as they say, he who dares wins. As Linda signed each document, Nick laid them out and handed them to Maggie, who lined them up and notarized them. Mrs. Buford, do you have a photo ID? asked Maggie. Linda stood up from the table to go get her purse. Maggie and Nick exchanged glances, but both had to quickly look down at the table to keep from laughing. Linda placed her driver's license on the table. Maggie took a photo of them on her phone and noted the details in her notary journal. Linda offered coffee, but both Nick and Maggie declined as Maggie finished marking the documents she had certified in her book while Nick put everything into separate folders. Linda's eyes continued to look up, waiting for Nick to try to go there, calculating her next move. Maggie left, putting all her things away and giving Nick a smile when Linda wasn't looking. Nick then gave Linda a break by saying he had a conference call to hold and would go down to his basement office to do it. Linda's shoulders relaxed because now she would have time to get Dwayne out the door and clear any trace of him before Nick emerged from his man cave again. Nick went downstairs to give her the illusion that she was still fooling him. He pretended he didn't hear the heavy footsteps on the steps as Dwayna fled or the sound of the garage door opening so Dwayna's car could leave. But when he heard the sound of the shower running in the master bathroom, Nick gathered everything he had, walked out the basement door, and drove off in his car without saying a word to his loving wife. Two hours later, after a hearty breakfast at the diner, Nick was in Harry's office. Harry looked shocked. So, you're telling me that you made your wife sign Form CC-1406, confirming the filing for divorce and waiving all future service of process and notice of any future proceedings? Yes, the duly certified form is right here. And so it was. You are also telling me that you forced your wife, an experienced lawyer, to sign a property settlement agreement in which she transfers to you all proceeds from any sale of your home and contents therein, cars and any jewelry she owns, keeps gives you free reign to manage her personal belongings and allows you both to walk away with the retirement accounts you each own, without any alimony from you to her, she still earns more than me. According to these documents, she expressed a willingness to leave the marriage with only about $125,000 of her retirement contributions, plus about $200,000 of her student loan debt from law schools. Right? She always had a very generous nature. Harry narrowed his eyes at Nick and returned to the papers on his desk. And you also made her sign an affidavit in which she admits to adultery and even admits that her lover was upstairs in the marital bedroom, 
at the time of signing the affidavit and was there all night after having sex with her the night before. Are you even telling me that her affidavit supports the truth and accuracy of that line in the email where she talks about staying with her lover because he is better at it? Is this what you want to tell me? Lawyer, Nick said. There were no emotions on his face, as far as he could restrain himself. Please don't insult me. The documents speak for themselves. Harry looked at the documents, looked up at Nick, started to smile, suppressed a smile, and then turned around in his chair. To hell with this. I will accept this file. You are a respected member of the bar and a friend from law school. How was I supposed to know you did all this shit? I thought it was good, Your Honor. I'm deeply confused. I was completely taken aback by the fact that my client had betrayed my trust. If anyone should have his license revoked, it's Nicholas A. Buford S. Kins, Your Honor. See where I'm going with this, Nick? To her. If necessary, will this notary certify that Linda signed all this? Yes, she will do that. Will she testify that Linda carefully studied the documents? I wouldn't want to try to prejudge or influence anyone's testimony, but as you say, Linda is an experienced trial lawyer, so I'm confident she gave the documents the attention she felt they deserved. I'm sure the notary will say that she saw Linda Buford go through the documents and sign each one. I cannot otherwise express an opinion about her state of mind regarding her understanding of the contents of each document. Okay then, said Harry. I'll record all of this today, plus Frank's affidavit and report, which includes photographs and a DVD. I'll see if I can't get this out of the electronic file for a while. We don't want this to still be in the news, do we? No, said Nick. Linda is going on a trip to Paris in just over two weeks. The longer it stays hidden, the better. Do you know anyone in district court? Do you remember Seth? Asked Harry. Student? A year after us? He's having trouble finding work at a law firm, so he's now working as a law clerk in the district court, trying to get his resume in order. He could speed up the process. But if the judge wants to take live testimony, the whole thing could collapse under its own weight. Linda will have to decide that she doesn't want to fight this for some reason if she realizes what's going on. If things go badly at this stage, I may have to resign as your lawyer. Fair enough. Someday you will be able to tell me the whole story. But I don't want to hear it now. Over the next two weeks, Nick managed to keep Linda at arm's length. He sent her text messages at odd hours, letting her know how busy he was, but otherwise answered her calls. Days passed, and she called less and less. You scared the crap out of her, Frank told him at the end of the week. According to our video footage, Dwayne hasn't been in the house since you showed up and surprised them Tuesday morning. I can't tell if they meet at his house during the week or have sex with each other in the office, but they don't do it at home. I'll tell you if anything changes. The only thing that changed was that Nick quietly returned to the house when he learned Linda had left and obtained the financial documents he thought he might need. He also signed a contract to sell the house with Sam Granger. The sale was scheduled to close during Linda's first week in France. In the evenings, Nick went to the gym, read in his spare time, and wondered how he got to the point where he was 30 years old with such a chaotic life. He told Sven that he needed to rest for a few more weeks, to which Sven reluctantly agreed. She's having fun with him in the house again, Frank said on Saturday, a week before Linda was due to leave for Paris. Thank you for warning me, Nick replied. He didn't really care, but he knew he would rather burn the sheets than sell them when he abandoned the house. By this time, Nick had already watched the video Frank gave him the first time. He could see the attraction. Dwayne was a couple of years younger, and Frank's investigation revealed that the guy was a regular at the gym, always warming up in front of the mirror before weight training. Otherwise, he was unremarkable. By comparison, Nick was in decent shape, but he certainly didn't have a washboard stomach. Obviously, Linda was looking for any deal. Nick could have done without such superficiality. Before Nick knew it, Linda was off on her long-awaited trip to Paris. One of Frank's men followed her to the airport and waited until the plane took off for Europe. After receiving the news, Nick went into the house, put all of Linda's clothes in a pile in the living room, and packed everything he wanted to keep. 
The movers arrived the next day, packed Linda's clothes into boxes, and sent them to the warehouse. They packed Nick's things separately and moved them to the apartment he found. Thanks to Sam Granger, a skilled house demolition specialist, Nick was able to sell the furniture easily. When the house was finally empty, Nick took one last walk before completing his final task. He carefully collected the wedding photographs and album, as well as Linda's wedding dress. He took them to the patio fire pit that was directly underneath the treehouse, carefully placed the photos and album in the pit on top of the charcoal, added the dress and some lighter fluid, and lit a match. After it all burned down, Nick was pleased to see that the video actually had a lot of detail. You could even see details of their memorable moments together in each photo as it was added to the pit. A day later, Nick completed the sale of his family home, using a power of attorney from his wife to sign as her attorney, in fact. She really should have read everything she signed. With a separate financial power of attorney, Nick was able to deposit the home sale proceeds check into his personal account, pre-certified on behalf of his wife as her attorney, in fact and closed the joint accounts. Three days later, still in the first week of Linda's trip to France, a construction crew leveled the house. They cleared the rubble in a few days. After this, work began on preparing the site. Unfortunately, the tree with the house, which was ideal for children, had to be removed. There was a gazebo on the new site. Unfortunately, at the moment when the entire place where Nick and Linda once had a happy home turned into just a large square of land, construction stopped. Looks like something went wrong with the permitting process. Nick and a friend from law school who worked in the county permitting department were confident that the problem would resolve itself within a couple of days after Linda returned home from France, once the appropriate forms were received and approved. During all this time, Nick did not answer a single call from Linda. He stopped texting her, didn't respond to emails, and didn't respond to voicemails. Some of her friends and relatives called. Nick sent a quick message back saying he was busy and traveling, mostly so they wouldn't try to drive by the house and see him. El Diablo called him on his prepaid cell phone and told him that Linda and Duane seemed to be under stress and weren't looking well. Maybe she suspected something was wrong? Nick asked how he knew this. El Diablo only said that he has friends everywhere, even in Europe. He did ask Nick if he would be interested in returning Linda's wedding and engagement rings. When Nick said no, El Diablo asked if he would mind if someone else bought them. Hell no. Fine. I might know someone who would like them. On Wednesday, two days before Linda was due to return from Paris, Nick was in Harry's office. I don't know how the hell this happened, but here's the divorce decree. This is much faster than usual for this type of case, and Seth remained silent. I don't want to know, and I don't ask. Count your lucky stars and congratulate yourself on being single again. Here's the copy I'm going to send to your ex-wife. I'm sure she'll be delighted. As Nick approached his car outside Harry's office, his phone rang. He didn't recognize the number, but when he answered, he recognized El Diablo's voice. Nick, you should take a vacation. Right now. Go to a place where there are a lot of people. People who know you and can tell you were there. El Diablo hung up. Nick realized that it had been a long time since he had seen his college friends who lived in New York. Luckily, his schedule was clear for the next few days, so he went on a trip that same day, attended several exhibitions, visited several museums, and went out with various combinations of friends for lunches, coffees, and dinners, most of which he paid for with a credit card. He also tipped generously at his hotel so that all the staff knew who he was. While there, he express-mailed a copy of the DVD showing him burning her wedding dress and wedding album to Linda's parents' house. Late Sunday evening, after enjoying coffee and pastries in Little Italy in Manhattan, Nick's phone rang. It was his father-in-law. Nick, where are you? Linda is going crazy. She is in the hospital. Yes? What's wrong with her? This was getting interesting. She returned from her trip on Friday, but she and her colleague were apparently kidnapped from the airport. They were both high on something and they only came out this morning. A colleague was beaten almost to death. And Linda, here her father's voice wavered. Once upon a time, Nick would have shown compassion. 
What happened to Linda? She woke up and found herself covered from head to toe with tattoos. Tattoos with terrible inscriptions. And as soon as she woke up and saw this, some guy in a mask came in and hit her on the nose, breaking it. And then with two more blows, he gave her two black eyes. Impressive, Nick thought. In fact, it was the cherry on the sundae. He would be happy if Linda realized that he betrayed her, just as she betrayed him in her marriage. It would be worth an immortal soul if he had one. Sorry to hear this. I'm out of town at the moment. What would you like me to do? Nick could tell there was surprise on the other end of the line. You are her husband. She's your wife. Sorry, not anymore. We divorced. The court order was issued last week. She's cheating on me with the guy she's traveling with. What? What here? What part was unclear? Nick knew he was being unnecessarily cruel now. But he didn't care. I have a video. I can send you a copy of her having sex like a cat, and not with me, if you want to know. There was silence on the other end of the line. Nick wondered if his father-in-law had had a heart attack. We're done with her, so you'll have to take her home. She's not my problem now. You did it? His father-in-law shouted. I... I've been in New York since Wednesday celebrating my divorce. Look, I know you're upset and I hope Linda gets better soon, but I don't think we have anything else to say to each other. He hung up. At that moment, it occurred to Nick that the stress of city life had recently become too much. He sent an email to Sven saying that, in the end, Sven and the firm could go to hell, with all due respect. A quick internet search revealed that there was an REI store in Soho, so Nick outfitted himself with some brand new hiking and camping gear. Linda had never liked hiking, so this was a chance to reconnect with his intelligence background. The hotel was very kind to store his luggage for a while for a reasonable fee, and before he knew it, he was heading into the Adirondack Mountains to commune with nature until things calmed down. Luckily, he had his passport with him in case he had time to travel to Canada. And it turns out he did. He spent most of the next eight weeks turning off his phone. At first, it seemed like some crazy woman had stolen his ex-wife's phone because there were dozens, if not hundreds, he didn't count, of messages that seemed to include frantic screaming and crying. He only listened to one or two before deleting the rest, and a lot of crazy emails. Her account must have been hacked. How was he supposed to find the time to read all of this? He hoped that whoever this crazy woman was, she got the help she so desperately needed. So eight weeks later, Nick met Frank for drinks. Harry was there too. Just to be clear, Harry said as they sat down, I ended our attorney-client relationship immediately after I gave you the divorce decree. I notified you by registered mail. Perhaps you haven't checked your email yet. Not yet, Nick admitted. It's a serious storm, my friend, said Harry. Frank, what would you say? More like a typhoon. I like it. Lots of destruction. Harry finished his bourbon and immediately asked for more. You start, Frank. So, on Monday morning, the former Mrs. Buford arrived at her old house with her parents. We never got around to removing the external camera. When she saw the vacant lot, she had a complete breakdown. She fell to her knees, sobbing, and assumed the fetal position ends with her kicking and screaming like a toddler at the mall late in the afternoon. Then a work crew arrives with equipment and she goes crazy again. She loses her composure for the third time when the construction workers see what is tattooed on her face and start laughing. And this despite the fact that she has raccoon eyes from the beatings, plus a band-aid on her broken nose. Harry picked up the story. That afternoon, she and a couple of lawyers from her large firm showed up at my modest office in a menacing mood. They didn't have an appointment, so I made them wait 25 minutes. I made sure my Glock was loaded and on my desk. Thank God we're in Virginia, you know. 25 minutes later, they are all yelling at me, talking about urgent motions, bar complaints, and contempt proceedings. I have to admit that I had a hard time not looking at the tattoos all over her face. This was done very clearly in red and blue ink so that it could be seen from a distance. When I was able to refocus, I asked what exactly the problem was, which statement in either statement was false. They all stopped and looked at each other. 
So I asked if there was any controversy about your ex-wife committing adultery. They all said yes. So I played a video that I prepared while they were waiting for good old Linda, apparently bouncing up and down on someone who is not her husband in the marital bed. Obviously, they haven't looked through everything in the case file yet. Then they all just looked confused. Linda then starts screaming that you didn't even give her a chance to explain herself. And I said, you don't care what the reason is. You just did it. She comes to her senses and starts talking about how she never agreed to let you sell the house and what was the story with you burning her wedding dress, photos, and album. All these things were her personal property. I showed her copies of the powers of attorney, one of which was for the specific purpose of selling the house. I showed her the property settlement agreement, which gave you the right to dispose of her personal belongings at your sole discretion, and told her that she was lucky to have her clothes. I asked if she denied that it was her signature on the documents. She said no, but that she never agreed with anything that was written there. So then I asked if her whole defense was that she never read what she signed. I asked her to imagine how cross-examination would go if she challenged anything in court. Then she fell silent. I also pointed out the affidavit she signed where she admitted that her lover was upstairs at the very moment she signed. And I asked if that was true. This was the moment when she lost consciousness. Her entourage tried to revive her, but I had already called 911. She refused to go with them to the hospital. But then she started screaming about tattoos and her boyfriend getting beat up, and I said it had nothing to do with you. As far as I know, you were out of town anyway, and maybe Dwayne pissed off some husband, either another wife having sex with her, or some other woman who thought Linda was taking Dwayne away from her. I told them they knew where the Fairfax Police Department was if they had a criminal case they wanted to discuss. Then things got even better, Harry continued. So they still kept talking about filing a motion for reconsideration and all that kind of stuff. That's when I told them that just that morning I had received an anonymous email with links to several videos of Linda and Duane in your bed when they started doing it again before the trip to Paris. The message said that the videos would be sent to everyone Linda knew and that you, Nick, knew nothing about it and could not stop them from doing it and that they were friends that you once helped and that they will protect you and that they would hit the send button that day if she didn't just let the whole thing go. Do you know anything about this? I was out of town, Harry. After that, they left. I haven't heard anything about them since then and nothing happened in the courthouse. It was Frank's turn again. They must have called the police because a couple of detectives showed up. They wanted copies of the videos and the report. Then they lost interest. Neither Linda nor Duane could say what happened, only that they got into a taxi at the airport, and the next thing the guy knew, he was in the hospital. With Linda, she woke up in a dirty hotel, got hit in the face, and then went to the hospital. The room was also billed to her credit card, plus room service and minibar. This time, Nick told him that the hotel manager had said that New York cops had checked out his stay at the hotel and that his New York friends had been contacted as well, but they all vouched for his very active schedule in the city. Rumor has it, Harry said, that your ex is hiding in her parents' basement while she gets laser tattoo removal. The problem is that they charge per square inch and it's covered from head to toe. It would have to cost tens of thousands of dollars and still, the marks would remain with her forever. It's a shame, Nick said. Harry stared at Nick. Frank simply pursed his lips to keep from laughing. What happened to your lover? I understand that he was badly hurt, said Harry. There will be a lot of physical therapy in his future. The head is slightly damaged. Multiple concussions. He will likely have some difficulty getting another job as a paralegal. Their firm also released them both. It seems their relationship fell apart during the trip and somehow this negatively affected the entire arbitration. There were not enough documents. Objections were not ready. Witnesses had problems. They lost on the merits. The client was unhappy. The firm had to make human sacrifices to retain the client for future work. Someday, Nick, you'll have to tell us how you managed to cope with this, Frank said. Dealt with what? I'm a Boy Scout. Maggie was waiting in the car when he got out. I'm a little upset, 
No one asked me if I actually certified the documents or if she read them before signing. I was willing to say that I watched her study each one before signing, but I couldn't estimate how much time she spent on it. We should discuss this over dinner. I need to treat you and your boyfriend to thank you for helping me gain my freedom. Maggie turned to him and looked over her sunglasses as Nick reversed the car out of the parking lot. There is no guy, idiot. Nick stopped abruptly and looked at her. Really? Indeed, now shut up and take me home so you can begin the rather long and grueling process of apologizing to me. Okay, Nick smiled. But first I have to stop by the post office. For what? I'm sending a card to an old friend, Nick said, pulling it out of the glove compartment. It had the Boy Scouts logo on the front. I asked her, does she feel safe now? Safe? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.